Um, and yeah, I put 20 years in the title, but obviously I've actually been working on this stuff for longer than that, and that's why I'm wearing glasses now, which um, I, <laughs> I, I, yes, anyway. So, um, the, uh, I've actually never been to a Force 11 meeting before, um, and which absolutely seems ridiculous given the sorts of things um, that I work on. Um, but I just wanted to actually mention, I was fortunate enough to be involved in one of the precursor meetings. There was a meeting that was um, convened by Microsoft um, and hosted at MIT. Um, and there were three things that really impressed me about that meeting. Um, and one was the enthusiasm and the range of stakeholders in the room. Um, so for the first time, I think we had commercial service providers together with public um, service providers, um, infrastructure providers of all types, researchers, librarians, publishers, um, research funders, um, and there was a real sense of energy and people seeking to work together and collaborate. Um, and so much so that also in that meeting, um, we actually, it was the first time I was involved in a sort of book sprint. And so um, we were all in self-selecting groups um, where we actually collaboratively wrote a paper of action to move scholarly communication forward. And I've been trying to decide or, or recall what it was that my group did, and I can't, I'm afraid, because it was quite a long time ago. Um, but the other thing um, in that meeting I, I recall was um, discussions in the sidelines, which were about um, how could we actually sustain a research infrastructure for open science, but what we were calling then research data. Um, and people concluded that what really needed to happen was to have a bottom-up initiative and a community initiative and to bring people together to collaborate internationally. Um, and what that was, was again what we know, now know as um, the Research Data Alliance. So really, it was, it was really interesting as a, as a meeting that it was really quite productive with all of that different energy. Um, and now we have Force 11, and I will come back to the community of Force 11 and the Research Data Alliance um, later. So when I was asked to speak here, um, as Helen has mentioned, I actually thought that I'd be speaking about the open access review that I've been working on for quite a long time. However, um, it's not quite out for consultation, so I'm not talking about the open access review, um, hence why I'm talking about reflections um, on infrastructure um, and developments around infrastructure for scholarly communications or what we might turn open science now. Um, I will have a perspective from a kind of cross-cutting infrastructure angle because that's really where I, I come from. Um, I'll look back in, at kind of examples of, of where we were um, and then some examples of success and what sorts of things um, seem to have grown and why they might have been successful and then obviously highlight um, some directions of travel. Um, and just to emphasise, so I am speaking from a personal perspective. I am not speaking for UKRI, UK Research and Innovation, that is, and I'm not speaking for JISC. Um, so, um, originally, I suppose the work that I was engaged in would be classed as digital library activity. Um, and so what we were really concerned with was trying to make sure that the analogue world worked in a digital sphere and trying to take advantage of the web so that information could be accessed, shared, and as far as possible, reused. And in 1999, um, we at JISC were working on a concept called the Distributed National Electronic Resource, um, which was one of Lorcan Dempsey's ideas. Um, and it soon mutated into the information environment. Um, and I don't know if anybody here, put up your hand if you remember the information environment architecture. Oh, Herbert does. Helen does. Yes, Carol does. Oh, Sally does. Um, yes, so I'm sure there's, a, I'm sure Robin does. Um, so the, the information environment architecture um, that Andy Powell developed um, was really, as I say, more of a, a, a digital library. But the way um, I suppose it was conceived was that you would have your, your user layer, although I have to say the user looked pretty static in this architecture. Um, 
and we'd have portals and aggregators, indexes, ontologies, um, and then a lot of shared services, which were things like registries, service registries, um, and the likes. Um, and I can remember presenting on it in San Antonio in 2001, and someone said to me, well, isn't that just the Holy Grail? Um, how's that possible? Um, and at the time, I was pretty stumped um, in terms of what to say. But now I think I know what my answer should have been, because I think we have learned quite a bit. So, of course, we did make progress with that approach, and there are lots of databases that have been made available and reused and are still available. Um, and, indeed, a lot of the, the um, services that were developed had machine-readable interfaces. I'm just not sure who consumed them, um, because, actually, the information environment, I think, was a little bit ahead of its time in terms of its concept. But I think there are, actually, also other elements um, to the information environment that we, we could have done differently um, and that we have learned about now. So during that period, there was also the birth, obviously, of um, the repository and Born Digital and more rapid scholarly communication with communities and research organisations becoming creators of collections that could be accessed openly and contributed to easily. And those did practically influence the information environment as well. So we did develop the ways in which we provided um, infrastructure and services according to um, new practice and technologies that came along. And of course, the real sort of essence, I suppose, of the repository was um, embodied in archive. Um, and the team that created or, um, archive and also um, OAI PMH, I'm going to mention Herbert quite a lot here, um, they obviously were thinking about the future of scholarly communication and how to create a successful infrastructure. And so I just wanted to reflect on one of their um, visions that they articulated in an article um, in DLib um, in 2004. So this was um, Herbert, Sandy Payet, John Erickson, Carl Lagozzi, and Simeon Warner. And what they said was, our vision is based on our belief that the future scholarly communication system should closely resemble and be entwined with the scholarly endeavour itself, rather than just being an afterthought or an annex. We argue for a scholarly communication system composed of an interoperable a substrate of allowing flexible composition of value-added services that up to now have been vertically locked in the journal publication milieu. In this loosely coupled system, the units of scholarly communication, i.e. data, simulations, informal results, preprints, could follow a variety of scholarly value chains in which each hub provides a service such as registering results, certifying their validity, alerting scholars to new claims and findings, preserving the scholarly record and ultimately rewarding scholars for their work. Um, so certainly that strikes me, although it was some 15 years ago, as the sort of thing that I would quite like to happen now. Um, and um, while the terminology um, of open research and open science came later, um, I think the, the essence of that vision, and Herbert correct me, would be about openness, transparency and collaboration. Um, and really within that future system, it's the sort of aspiration that I think we still have. So certainly, while I'm sure there are some infrastructures working for particular communities that might have most of those characteristics, um, I don't think that we have anything at the scale that's required. Um, and we certainly are not looking at um, the whole range of different units of scholarly communication and the reward system um, isn't operating um, in fully across um, the range of research that's undertaken. So on reflecting how infrastructure and scholarly communications might develop, I just wanted to share um, a few of the successes um, that I think have come up along the way. And I will start with looking at repositories and um, the, the, the stack, obviously, that they were to offer for open science. Um, and as I said earlier, starting back in the 90s, so we had the repository systems, of course, um, ePrints, DSpace, Fedora, and others as key foundations. Um, 
and we had the network of repositories was born. Um, repository managers became a profession. Um, but then in terms of looking at how to improve that infrastructure, so it was um, working, um, I, I suppose, in ways that support the research process um, more fluidly, fluidly and also um, respecting the content so it could move in ways um, across different systems and different workflows. Um, there were, of course, lots of different initiatives. And one I just wanted to mention um, was a meeting that was hosted in New New York called Augmenting Interoperability Across Scholarly Repositories. So this meeting was sponsored by Microsoft, Mellon, um, the Coalition of Networked Information, the Digital Library Federation, and something called the Joint Information Systems Committee, which is now called JISC. Um, and essentially, this was about considering um, some of the key new protocols that might be required to make repositories work. Um, <laughs> And this is where um, Herbert presented around OAI or um, as a new protocol um, to help um, communicate compound objects in the way of the web. Um, so you were looking at a web-like um, architecture. Um, and my colleague, Rachel Heary at the time, put forward um, the case for a put interface. Um, which seemed extremely modest. I can remember when um, Rachel was um, presenting for it, she was thinking, oh gosh, in comparison to OA OAI or it's really so simple. On reflection, I think, we can see that OAI or was taken up, but again, a bit like some of those things in the information environment, it was a little bit ahead of its time. Um, but the put interface became SWORD. Um, and of course, SWORD um, is now used, um, well, was used actually quite soon after um, that meeting. It was developed um, across repositories around the world um, and is still in place. So in terms of, I suppose, other cross-cutting sorts of infrastructures and where they might come from, um, and uh, another global one is, of course, um, the Sherpa services. And in actual fact, um, I don't know how many people may realise this, the Sherpa services came from a repository project that was at Loughborough University. Um, and so what they had found in the library at Loughborough, they were having to look at publisher policies um, so people could actually put content into the repository. And so they created this database and then thought, well, hang on a moment. Um, surely everybody's having to create this database. And so that's how the Sherpa services were born. And of course, um, they've now become, um, again, a global um, infrastructure. Although that's not to say um, without any challenges. Of course, the challenge of actually sustaining um, a, a global service that is completely open has been um, an issue. And of course, Sherpa is mainly funded from um, within the UK, although through SCOS, which is that initiative um, that, that started from the Knowledge Exchange Partnership, which I think they've had some meetings here over the last couple of days. So that um, international partnership or European partnership, where they were really considering how to deal with sustainability. So they established, um, as a result of that, it wasn't really the Knowledge Exchange that established it, but a group of experts came up and recommended that you needed to have um, a, a group that would give a sort of stamp of approval, if you like, to say, yes, this service is something that is valuable, the community values it, and so people should then go and contribute to it um, and pay to make it sustainable. Um, other sorts of successes, of course, within the repository um, landscape are um, those domain-specific repositories, so Europe PubMed. So you've, you've got a repository, it's working with a community, it closely meets those researchers' needs. Um, but indeed, although um, Europe PubMed is really successful, it does have mandates as well, so it's built a critical mass of data. Um, now, because there's so much information there, it is a really useful research tool for text and data mining, um, and also for research management. The amount of people that use that corpus um, in other services is quite remarkable. Institutional repositories, so um, being someone within the UK that's worked in that space for a number of years, um, institutional repositories 
do have value and of course they are there to show case research or indeed to give every single researcher or even any um, stakeholder within your institution a place to share and reuse resources if they don't have a domain specific repository. They're also there to spark um, or to support strategic partnerships. Um, but there is an issue in terms of, or there has been, of course, an issue in terms of populating those repositories we've certainly found. And so although a protocol like SWORD helped a bit, um, actually, again, policy mandates seem to make a very big difference. And so one thing here um, that made a difference with um, institutional repositories, the Research Excellence Framework, um, which is a very big deal um, in the UK in terms of assessing research for its excellence, and then a lot of money follows um, the, the outcomes of that process back to universities. So back in 2013, um, the REF announced that it would be um, putting in place an open access policy that said um, for outputs to be in scope to the REF, so to be submitted um, and considered, they needed to be open access and deposited within a repository. There are lots of different nuances to that, and the REF always has some exceptions, because it, it has to, because obviously it's a tool that includes the whole of research within a research performing institution. But you could really see a remarkable difference after that, um, that policy came into force. So, for example, in University of Cambridge Library, back in 2013 when it was announced, they had 2,000 articles in their repository, um, and now they've got 30 3,000 articles deposited in their repository. Um, and then at Imperial College, the same story for the Faculty of Medicine. So back in 2013, 9.3% um, 9 of the publications that year from that faculty were deposited in the repository. And then by 2018, it was at 60% um, deposited in the repository. And actually, if they look at um, all of the different aspects of open access, then within that uh, medical faculty within Imperial, you're, it's actually now just a sliver, which is subscription access. The rest is open access under various different form, uh, forms. So overall, I think my observations would be um, in terms of what's been successful in developing that infrastructure is, of course, working with disciplines, working with researchers. And so repositories, in order to be a tool um, for research, they need to be embedded with those communities or working very closely with them. And so I think we do need to ask about, and, and I'm sure it's being discussed here, but I haven't been at the meeting, but you know, can repositories take on board the next generation um, recommendations from CORE? And will that make them a more useful and um, usable set of services um, for researchers and research and part of the future of scholarly communication? And then in terms of, I suppose, some of those, um, those small successes that we've had, which have actually been quite big successes, things like Sword and Sherpa, absolutely they've been um, hitting a key use case um, and a pain point. And so, hence, they've been successful and sustainable. And that's not to say that they will always be valid because things will change. Um, and then just thinking about those sorts of um, key small services that make a big difference. I think it's also worth just reflecting on Creative Commons. I think like Sword and Sherpa, it's got a really well-defined use case. Um, and I recall when it emerged, it seemed really easy to understand immediately. They'd put this wrapper around complex legal issues that could be understood all of a sudden. Um, however, that really you know, I don't think we should underestimate the amount of time and effort it took for that to become business as usual. At first, people were unsure whether to trust those licenses. Um, did they actually stack up within their um, jurisdiction? So there were loads and loads of different legal reviews undertaken um, and a hell of a lot of work from the Creative Commons team in terms of working with different stakeholders. Um, but I think one of the key things, um, and whilst um, you know, we've now got um, ubiquitous use of those Creative Commons licenses, um, and of course, they are in mandates, but I don't think it's about the mandates. I think it is about 
an absolutely brilliant user experience. They are fantastic. Um, and I also think, again, it's about having worked with researchers from the beginning. So those licenses actually support scholarly norms such as attribution, um, no derivatives. And, and so it was really being, I think, um, created from the research need up front has really meant that they're successful. So then uh, how do those sorts of qualities for some parts of the infrastructure um, play out when you're talking about something that's a little less tangible? Um, and so something that I think, and I've, I've heard people talking about them already this morning, um, that are really critical, and I think they've really come of time, are of course persistent identifiers. And by that I mean persistent identifiers for a whole range of different entities. Um, and again, it's, it's been something that has um, been discussed for a long time, but it's some of the, the kind of business models and the governance models around these things which help them operate. Um, so, Putting DOIs aside, because um, they have been around for some time, although of course we did have wars about, should we actually use DOIs? Are we comfortable with their governance? Um, are they actually part of the community? And so of course, lots of those issues have been addressed, but I think you know people are now pretty comfortable that the, the business model and governance around them um, works. But looking at ORCID, so ORCID was really quite a, a tricky one. Um, and um, researcher identifiers. So, I mean, you know, when you just think about it, um, having an identifier for a researcher, uh, imagine the paranoia. It can cause all types of suspicion from researchers. Um, and when the initiative emerged as well, there was, again, this usual lack of trust. Uh, was it governed in the right way? Were the right people involved? Um, and here in the UK, in order to make the decision to move forward with ORCID and see that it was something that we should adopt, there was a lot of activity, again, I suppose, in the way don't underestimate the amount of activity around Creative Commons. So we undertook a lot of consultation with a whole range of different stakeholders. Um, also looked at the, um, the, the, the business model and the business case for ORCID, fed back a lot of that into the ORCID organisation to influence its direction of travel. Um, also uh, considering issues around data protection. Um, and we also undertook pilots, so a whole number of pilots to look at the way in which um, actually getting researchers engaged with ORCID and institutions engaged could work and the sorts of different models that they might need to use. So there was a clear case for funders and universities to track principal investigators' activities, um, for data collection agencies or publishers to trust those identities. Um, but having that good case for researchers wasn't so straightforward. Um, and ORCID made sure that researchers' needs were built into the design. So the researcher owned um, the ORCID and owned the information. Um, and also, as well as cutting down that pain on reporting on ORCID, you can really see in the end why it's become something that has been taken up because it does really play to rewarding researchers as well. But it just wasn't um, such an easy case to make. Um, and so a lot of effort went into um, creating a structure for ORCID to be acceptable to a range of different stakeholders. And now, of course, we've seen it go from strength to strength. Um, so I think now that we've seen that case of ORCID um, and it's raised awareness, uh, and, and one of the key things I think um, ORCID has done is really raise awareness with re research funders around how um, identifiers could be useful um, and could be taken forward. So I think um, there, there is indeed, you know, there's challenges around organisational identifiers, um, grant IDs and everything, but I think it's come of time and, it, um, and it's something um, that we should be working together on um, to achieve um, the scholarly infrastructure that, well, if we go back to that first description, they would be um, valuable parts there. So. I know I've, I've talked about small pieces, really, that, that join up um, infrastructure in a cross-cutting way. Um, I just want 
to acknowledge that I do recognise um, that there are really good disciplinary infrastructures um, and indeed um, of diff all different sites of, um, I suppose, scale and um, so, for example, the Chemistry Development Toolkit is one um, at Maastricht University and Cambridge University. There's a third university, but it's actually working with um, a fairly small community. A um, hundred, I think, um, use it, but um, the researchers that developed it are absolutely confident in, in its sustainability because it's well used and they use it in their everyday research. <coughs> And I think you'd see similar things with some of the S3 infrastructures as well, although, of course, they receive, um, they receive funding from other streams, whereas some of those infrastructures, such as the Chemistry Development Kit, it's really all done on the, good, the goodwill of those researchers doing it as part of their um, activity. So um, if I was asked now um, about the information environment and someone said to me um, so how's that going to be achieved surely it's the holy grail I think some of the key things that I wish I'd been able to say now <laughs> would have been well it will work because actually we're working with researchers and they're engaged in its design and its creation we couldn't say that because it wasn't true. Um, and um, we would also say um, that we were working globally. We weren't just working within the UK. It wasn't a distributed national electronic resource or an information environment for the, for the UK. It would actually be something that was working globally um, because research is global and the effort for this infrastructure is global. And I think... I would also say there's a community made up of developers, researchers, curators, private and public infrastructure and service providers, as well as research funders and policy makers, all working together to create the standards, best practice to support the infrastructure and enhance it. So a bit like this meeting, a bit like the Research Data Alliance and some of the activities that they're taking forward. And I think these are obviously, you know, they're some of the key factors about creating um, an infrastructure that works. Um, but while I see that those sorts of things are part of the answer, I think there are um, some other aspects that we need um, to think about. So if we look back at that vision from um, Herbert and team in 2014, we've still got a long way to go to alter the unit of scholarly communication, um, where they talked about data simulations, informal results and preprints and rewarding the researcher for that. And if I can just reflect a little bit on my last year of um, developing the um, open access policy for UK research and innovation. For those people that are, are are not aware of um, the UK research landscape. So UK research and innovation has a budget of 7 billion um, across a whole range of different disciplines. So it is actually really quite complex to um, look at open access policy. Um, and in order to take policy um, forward, um, and to move open access forward, even in an environment where we've already got an open access policy and have had for a number of years, I can say it's extremely difficult with the amount of different interests from different stakeholders. Um, there's obviously a whole diversity of different types of publishers that can change and move at different times. Um, and researchers, I mean, when we've spoken to researchers, um, we've had quite a few con consultation events with researchers. They have, they've all been for openness and they all want a simple policy, but they all want it to be different for their discipline. So it's really, really, really challenging. So, you know, even when you're looking at something that should be a fairly simple thing to move, it, yeah, it's... it's um, yeah, don't underestimate, I suppose, some of the challenges that we've got. Um, I've already said, but I do think that repositories need to embrace the next generation repository agenda from core um, if they're going to become more of a foundation with added value um, for research. Um, I also think that we need to build bridges to ensure that all researchers have access to infrastructure and services and other people's data. Um, but one thing um, that really requires attention 
Um, and I don't hear that much about it, and I don't know whether um, you have been um, discussing it here, but is real cross-disciplinary infrastructure, infrastructure that facilitates and encourages cross-disciplinary partnerships and also working with others such as industry. Um, I believe this is the vision of the European Open Science Cloud, but building or evolving it in the right way is going to be a real challenge. I mean, how do you bring all those different parts of infrastructure together to achieve something with that ambition? Um, one of the things in that, that um, area, which um, Geoffrey Bolton has suggested before, and I think you know, it's maybe worth thinking about, is um, perhaps research funders could look at when they support cross-disciplinary research, actually also investing in some of the infrastructure issues, because quite often what happens um, is people say, I can't do it, we can't really collaborate because I don't understand their data, I don't understand their practice. So you probably need to invest in some of the infrastructure to make some of that translation happen. Another real driver for change, um, which I, 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 I'm sure it would be remiss if I didn't mention it, is of course reproducibility. Um, and there was a great report published this year um, by um, the National Science Foundation and the National Academy of Sciences and Engineering, um, which reflected on um, the issue. And one of their recommendations was that um, well, one of their reflections was that archives um, that store digital artefacts and link to published results are just inconsistently maintained at the moment um, across journals, academia, federal institutions and disciplines. And so it really makes it difficult for scientists to identify the right archives to curate, store and make available their digital artefacts. And so that there should be interventions in that space. Um, so I suppose, um, in summary, it would be nice, and, and maybe, um, maybe eight years ago, I would have said, oh, you know, there's this huge technology that's come along and it's going to transform everything and research is going to be completely different. Um, but I just don't believe that there is that next big technology or disruption that's going to change. Um, and if it does happen, I don't think we should wait for it because we've got to just keep progressing. Um, and I think, you know, we have learned a lot in the last um, 20 years about ways of working and working together. And we've got some good examples of how to have a scholarly infrastructure um, that is trusted and collaborative. Um, and so we really have to um, collaborate across all of those different stakeholders. And I do think it's quite, that, that there is quite a change in terms of um, the range of stakeholders working together to make things happen. Um, and so, yes, I, I shall leave it there. Thank you. Right, we have um, about five minutes or so for questions. Do we have any questions for Rachel? One of the questions that always comes up, uh, thank you, that was a lovely overview of the history of infrastructure, is, is where, uh, how is the sort of community infrastructure, the global community infrastructure that you're talking about, going to be uh, sustainable? How, uh, there isn't, um, it's not apparent from the funders that that money for just infrastructure, both the technical and the social infrastructure, is there, and it's not coming from institutions either. So how does... <laughs> Where, where is the money to support this going to come from? Yep, um, the, the kind of um, continual question. I suppose I, I, I could um, say, oh, the European Open Science Cloud will solve it all. Um, I, don't, I don't think Carol Govel says no. Uh, um, <laughs> um, I think that um, for me, I, I do think there is an opportunity for um, some of that community infrastructure to have the support from funders. Um, I suppose I do think that the RDA should probably do more about trying to address that, that gap. Um, 
I I believe that um, funders are interested in infrastructure that supports research. Um, and indeed, I, I think some of the um, different communities now have, you know, uh, outreach officers to, to try and make those cases. Um, I don't have an answer for where the money is going to come from, um, apart from um, it, and I will go back to the European Open Science Cloud because actually member states and um, governments are thinking about, so what does that mean? What do we need to invest to make this happen? The thing is, it's trying to, to get a grip on exactly what the European Open Science Cloud is and how far it, um, what infrastructure is included within it. But if you look at, um, I suppose if you look at an example, so in Germany, um, they've sort of taken um, the, the vision of the European Open Science Cloud and then said, right, in order for us to provide an infrastructure that works for researchers, we need to make sure that we've got all of the different communities in place working together. So they've put a sort of community governance um, creation um, network together. Um, and they've made a case to, I can't remember how many millions of euros. Um, so, so I do think, you know, there is the possibility um, that central um, funding from um, public funding agencies could follow through, but, but it does need um, coordination. Any more questions? Thank you. Hi, Rachel. Um, so this kind of follows on from Katrina's remark, actually, about supporting um, infrastructures. One of us is get. I mean, after five years at Orchid, working very hard to actually get researchers to engage with what was, on the face of it, a relatively straightforward tool, it's actually very difficult to sustain that energy and sustain that interaction. And what we've found is that, you know, things like research evaluation exercises, large reporting exercises, top-down policies and mandates seem to be the most effective tool at our, at our disposal to actually kind of create change at scale. Um, but I don't like those um, mm. for all kinds of reasons. So I guess the question here is you've got a great crowd of, you know, not, I mean, I speak as a persistent identifier provider, but there are funders, service and platform developers, policy nerds, all kinds of open obsessives in the room here. It's a great chance for us to actually kind of figure out what do you think we could do more to strategically engage with researchers to kind of accelerate the shift to open and, and generate the kind of action we need them to take? Um, I guess, uh, well, one body that I would say um, needs to be considered is, of course, um, learned societies and working with um, learned societies and academies um, and making the, the case to them um, and using um, those organisations as a way to communicate and convene. Um, I think now that, um, I, I, not really with, yeah, with a UKRI hat on. So I know that within UKRI, everybody is actually really interested in those questions. Um, and, you know, there's the new grant system coming in and all of those things. So um, I, I do also believe that um, research funders would be able to convene some of those um, those discussions because I, I think, I, you know, I was trying to say that I, I think research funders now can see the value of some of those um, bits within the infrastructure. Um, and so, therefore would be prepared to convene some of those um, discussions. Um, yeah. Okay, I think one more question. Do we have one? It's a big room, just if everyone's out. Hi, Rachel, thanks very much so far. Um, I was also going to ask a question about the EOSC developments, but not from the funding perspective, but more like you, you have the experience with these developments that take a lot of stakeholders. In this case, we talk about national infrastructures that are really in place already, and you have this big EOS king <laughs> above it. 
with your experience, how do you think this will develop? Will we indeed be able to get to a European EOSC functioning in, let's say, harmony with the national infrastructures and what needs to be done to get that accomplished? Thanks. Yeah. Um, it, well, um, in terms of I'll, from the governance board perspective um, of EOSC, that is one of the critical issues. And I will say that all of the member states around the table want to find the answer to that very question, Baz. Um, now, some of them, and I've already mentioned Germany, are sort of taking a lead in it. So they're saying, OK, um, so we do all aspire to that vision but we need a federated infrastructure. It needs to be federated in the right way. And what that means is our um, infrastructure is part of the European Open Science Cloud. So, you know, they, they've sort of uh, taken um, the lead there in terms of putting structures in place. And you're also seeing some other countries um, follow suit, such as the Netherlands and France. Um, I think that um, the the... The EOSC obviously isn't supposed to be seen as this big central endeavour. Um, they are always at pains to say that, you know, it's non-exclusive entry point. Um, it's more about just making sure um, that the way in which the services work um, is is similar. Um, I think that um, there's, a, there's a long way to go in terms of being able to see how that translates into practice um, but you can even see if you, well if you if you look at say the fair aspect of the European Open Science Cloud so really that is being operationalized in the RDA um, and through the RDA groups so as long as um, we're using the current structures um, and as long as um, the member states um, work in a way, because of course they already fund a lot of infrastructure which would be classed as part of the European Open Science Cloud. I, I think it can be done, but I do think, um, I, I do think that model in Germany of, of actually convening and bringing people together um, to try and coordinate it is, is essential. Okay, thank you. We're out of time now, so I'd just like to thank Rachel again.